Today we honor those families and those that have made that ultimate sacrifice, and we thank them today. Let's give them a thank you one more time. Thank you. So as we move forward here, uh, our small groups are happening uh, starting today. As our, uh, we have them throughout the week, and you can uh, sign up for one either on the Church Center app or on your way out of service uh, today where you can sign up for those. Uh, we really encourage you to be part of a small group. Coming on Sundays, either online or in person, is just honestly not enough. Uh, you need to find some community, and we encourage you to take that extra step to go ahead and to be part of a small group during the week. We have all different kinds. It's not just the same type of group. Everyone's different. Please uh, go ahead and make this part of your, your weekly journey. I'm not just talking to your neighbor. I'm talking to you, all right? Okay, so I'm not just talking to the other people in the room. I'm talking to you right now. So please uh, go ahead and uh, sign up for one and become part of one today. I want to say this to those of you that are joining us online. Uh, we have many of you still online. Uh, if there is something that is hindering you from being able to join us in person, please let us know if there's something that we can do to help you make that back, make that journey back. We would love to help you get back in person. There's just nothing quite like gathering in person uh, to worship uh, together. Father's Day Pig Roast, as you saw, is coming up very soon. Um, uh, this is the, a great event where children become vegans following uh, this event when they see where their food really comes from. So uh, please, please join us for that. Sign up. But uh, I've heard rumor that we're doing axe throwing this year. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So hopefully it's a good thing. So we're going to uh, work on some axe throwing there. So... Today, as we're ju jumping into our series, Taking Back What the Enemy Stole, uh, as we started a couple weeks ago, what do you do when Satan has stolen your hope? What do you do when hope is lost? You, maybe you used to have hope, but now you're not sure. You're not sure what happened and where did it go? Hope is a complicated thing and it's very easy to lose. Every single day, if you turn on the news, you will see evidence of evil in the world. Evidence of real spiritual forces creating destruction and destroying hope. It is so constant and pervasive that it is often the only thing we hear about. And it seems like it's being strategically planned and orchestrated by some force. And that's because it is being orchestrated. There's a puppet master, and it's not God. When you, if ever in your life you have walked in the ways of unrighteousness or you've turned down the alleys of wickedness or when you've chosen to follow the voice of the masses, you have learned that there is a force trying to lead you to destruction. And you must recognize that there is a pattern that you can objectively see and that for century after century after century, a common wicked hand has been leading humans into destruction. Killing, stealing, and destroying property, prosperity, lives, families, dreams, and hopes. Jesus calls the orchestrator out by name. He calls him Satan. And Satan brings destruction wherever he goes. If you just take a moment today and do a quick evaluation of your life. There, that's enough time probably. The, uh, it... it <clears throat> And if you look quickly back at the last 20 years of your life, and it looks like you basically have left a trail of tears, emotional litter, and a burned out forest of a life, that probably means the enemy has been at work in your life, trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And that is a very common experience. I don't know if you've seen these California wildfires that happen every single year. California wildfires. I mean, they, they, I don't even know if they, how they have forests left, but they've had so many fires out there. But they seem to destroy everything in their path. No matter what, they, it, it just gets, whoo, destroys it. And there's two things that have to come together to put these massive fires out. First, it takes massive human effort. Specialty trained firemen from around the world with special equipment, hundreds of thousands of man and woman hours, hundreds of millions of dollars then it also takes the weather, either a change in temperature or humidity or wind or rain has to change. And then they can put them out together. Well, putting out spiritual fires 
and that are bringing destruction, putting those things out, bringing them to an end, usually require two forces as well. It takes personal effort, but if the only thing you do to try to put out those fires is personal effort, you will constantly fail. It also requires God's intervention. Personal effort and God's intervention. Those are how we deal with putting out those fires. Now, when you give your life to Jesus, when you say to God, God, I give you control of my life, I surrender to you. I surrender myself to you. Those are just words until you actually follow through with that. And when your words and your actions come into alignment, that is when God begins to lead you beside still waters and restore your soul. That is the heart of surrender. There is no such thing as surrendering to God without giving Him more and more and more control of you. I know a handful of things. One of the things I know is this. Jesus still changes people's lives. I get to kind of be on the front row of life, of watching people's lives be changed by Jesus. And I get to tell other people about how lives are being changed by Jesus right here in Lynn and Revere. And when other people hear that that God is not forgotten about Lynn and Revere, that God has not forgotten about you, it gives them hope for their life as well. Maybe God hasn't forgotten about them either. It is so awesome to recognize what God is doing amongst us at East Coast International Church in Lynn and Revere. So much so that sometimes I feel bad for Marblehead and Swampskit and Salem and the Hunt. <laughs> for real, I do. I, I know God's up to something there, but I wonder what it is. And then I start to wonder what our role is supposed to be in that. And those are real prayers of mine. That brings us to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. says faith. Somebody say faith. faith. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Verse 6, it is possible, impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So a question for us to wrestle with today is, what does faith actually look like in the battle of life? In this, in this battle zone that we call the world, what does faith actually look like? Well, in this passage in Hebrews, it was written to encourage the faith of the people at the time and us as well. It turns out that their faith is being challenged. They are struggling. The enemy has stolen things from them. They are being persecuted for their faith, even to the point of death. Hebrews 10.32 says this to them. Think back on the early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering? It's a call to remember what God has done for you. Verse 39, but we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. This is a call. Hebrews is a call to not give up. It's a call not to give up. It's a call not to pick up. It's a call not to lean into the despair, even though things might get difficult. It's a call to persevere, to hold on even when you feel like letting go. Hold on anyhow. Sometimes in this waiting process, it's very, very easy to go back to what you used to do. When things get hard, when things get difficult, it's easy to go back to who you used to be. We default. We have these default mechanisms. And when you're not paying attention, you default back to your street thinking. You begin to trust your feelings more than you trust your faith. We revert to unhealthy patterns 
to try to cover up the discomfort that we then have. That's the real challenge that we all face, every single one of us. There was a man named Peter. Peter was a future leader of the Jesus movement that we're part of today. Peter had a moment of confusion, a moment of struggle with his faith that was rather significant. As one of the leaders of the Jesus movement, he denied Jesus. That seems like a problem. And it was. He knew it was a problem. He was ashamed, and he went back to his old life. And in John chapter 21, Jesus finds Peter. He finds Peter fishing for fish instead of fishing for people. Why is that a big deal? Because Jesus had asked Peter and given him the opportunity to fish for people instead of for fish. And when he denied Jesus, he went back to his old way. What, happened? what did he do? He had a moment of failure, doubt, and the enemy stole his faith from him. And he went back to fishing for those fish because that's what he knew. That's what he knew how to do. That's what worked for him in the past. And somebody, needs today, somebody today needs to listen to this, whether in person or online. Maybe you have some skill sets or opportunities from your past or even your present that are not actually what God has instructed you to do or to be. It may be profitable. It may be convenient. You may even perceive it as urgent or necessary, but you need to burn it to the ground. All the way to the ground. So you can't even go back to it because it's not there anymore. Just let it sink in. What does that mean? Maybe your marriage hasn't turned out the way you had planned. Maybe your kids picked up some of your brokenness and now struggle with some of it on their own. Those are hard things. It's in those moments that we still must persevere. Because when you walk by faith, you walk into the arena of the unknown. And in that arena of faith, all things are possible. All things are possible. When you burn it all down and step into that arena, that's where miracles happen. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about the things we cannot see. Faith here is present tense. Hope is the future. Our faith now, hope for the future. What is faith? Well, you, you already understand faith on some level. When you get into a car, you have faith that you put gas in it and it will start, right? You have some kind of faith. You're hoping. When you get onto a plane and you let somebody fly you that you have never met and have no idea about their qualifications or credentials, that's called faith. Faith is an interesting gift that we are given by God. And in the spiritual realm, faith is a gift that God gives you. And you need to unwrap that gift and you need to activate that gift. For some of you, your faith has been dormant for a long time. You might still consider yourself a person of faith, a follower of Jesus, but you've been stuck. You've been stuck to a place where maybe fear has crept in and crippled you. Maybe you're just not using your faith. And so if you're looking closely at your life, that would be why you are operating by fear and not by faith. That's why you don't have the hope that perhaps you once had. Faith is the thing that activates hope. It's like lighting a, lighting a candle, lighting a fire. If you're going to light a fire, you need oxygen for that fire to exist. Without oxygen, if there's no oxygen, if there is no oxygen in this room, I cannot light a fire. You would also all be dead. Faith is the oxygen to the fire of hope. You need 
that oxygen. Because hope always follows faith. No oxygen, no fire. No faith, no hope. Now, when you're in a situation and faith steps in and says you're going to make it, when you're in a situation that you can't possibly make it, when you're in your situation where it's absolutely impossible, there is no hope, faith says there is hope. Faith says that there is nothing impossible with God. That's what the author is telling people here in Hebrews. Don't give up. Don't slip back. Don't fall into the old patterns of your life. Don't fall, fall into patterns of ridiculous thinking. And then he jumps ahead and reminds people of just how great God is by rehearsing with them the stories of people that uh, have experienced great miracles in spite of betrayal, in spite of tragedy, in spite of disappointment and challenges. These are people that made it through and did great things and held on to their hopes and dreams. The author of Hebrews tells about Joseph and the many miracles that took place because of Joseph, even though he had once been greatly betrayed. The story of Moses in the wilderness and on and on the stories go. But the idea is this. There are people that have come before us that have already been through the fire of life and they still had hope because they did not surrender their faith. When doctors speak of hope, they understand that many patients die because they lose hope. My hope does not come from doctors. My hope does not come from lawyers. My hope does not come from the government, ever. It comes from what God says. It comes from what the Scripture says, that He will never leave you or forsake you, and when you call on His name, He will answer. That's where my hope comes from. When you have a little faith... You need to develop that faith, little by little. You need to develop that faith and allow it to get stronger. You need to treat faith like a muscle that you're trying to develop and get healthy. We know this, that if you don't exercise, you get unhealthy. Sorry, but it's true. If you don't exercise your faith, you get unhealthy as well and sluggish. There's a sequence to this. Faith then hope, then assurance. And sometimes we lose things in the middle. During the journey, it has a way of getting hard. Lewis and I went hiking this week. We hiked Mount Madison, eight miles, four hours up. I mean, four miles up. And it's painful and horrible. It's like the worst thing I do. You know, you're just hiking up these mountains. It's awesome. And we, Stacy asked me why we do this. I said, so we can tell stories afterwards. So, but, the, uh, but there's this moment in a hike, you're like three miles in, and everything in your body is burning, and oxygen is depleting. You start to make excuses. Like, oh, it's just a bad hiking day. I, I just really can't finish today. Or you're thinking things like, oh, the oxygen is thin up here. That's why, I, that's why my cardio isn't good. Yeah, right. The, uh, so uh, the, uh, so you're, you're just doing this thing. You're like, three miles. Oh, I, I, I can't, we're almost there. It's good enough. It's good enough. It's only a mile away from the top. But it's the hardest mile. You start to think, maybe I should just turn back now. All these things just go through your head, right? They're just going through your head. And then if you keep st- taking the next step forward, next step forward, you're, you're now you're three, mi- three and a quarter miles, three and a half miles, and you're like, oh, whew, I, sh- I can turn back now. It's fine. it's fine. But then you can see the top. You can see the top of the mountain. It's only half a mile away. And then it turns out it's really not the top of the mountain. It's a false summit. And, there's like, and you're like, oh, then you get to the false summit, and then there's like another peak but you're pretending like it's the real top, but now you know it's really just another false summit as well. And so there's three or four of these things. It's horrible, by the way, when this happens. But the whole time you're fighting this desire to turn back, to turn back, to turn back. But the reality is you're almost there. It's like when you're almost there, there's this moment right before you're there where you're like, 
I could still turn back and not get there. That happens to a lot of us in our journey of faith. It starts to get hard right before the top, and we turn back before we get there. You might just be a moment away from assurance, from seeing the hand of God intervene. The pressure, the suffering, the criticism gets to be too much. But that assurance is right there. The evidence is right there. When you walk by faith, God honors you and God blesses you. When you walk by faith and hold on to hope, it looks like this. We find it in Job chapter 23. Job was a guy in the scripture that went through a whole bunch of very challenging situations. And he's feeling a little lonely. Maybe God's abandoned him. And he's looking for God. And he says in verse 8, I go east, he is not there. I go west, I cannot find him. I do not see him in the north, for he is hidden. I look to the south, but he is concealed. Verse 10. But he knows where I am going. And when he tests me, I will come out pure as gold. For I have stayed on God's path. I have followed his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food. There's some intensity there. Even when he couldn't, even when he couldn't hear God, he was still all in because he was assured. He had an assurance that God was for him and not against him. An assurance that God did it once before and he could do it again. And that's our assurance today, that God did it before and he can still do it again. Now in this, in this journey, there's this moment like Job experienced where it seems like there's some silence going on from God. But silence does not mean absence. It's often a faith-building moment. When you're learning uh, to ride a bike, you know, you're, you're given instructions or trying to figure out how to ride a bike. When, I would, when the girls were younger, we'd try to instruct the girls on, on how to ride a bike, and you'd put training wheels on a bike, and it's a tiny little bike, and you work with them a few times, and then eventually, after they're used to that, you take off the training wheels, and you do this really horrible thing as a parent. There's no training wheels. You get them on the bike, you're holding it, and you push them off as you're running beside them. You let go and you say nothing. You're just silent. Because they must learn to implement the instructions they already have. They don't need any more instruction. In some things in life, you've got to learn to ride through with the skills that God has already given you. You don't need any more skills. You already have enough to make it through that one. God has a way of teaching us gradually so that we can become skilled as we mature. You don't start on the tall bike, you start on the small bike. And it gives you the skills you need to step up. Where I learned to ride a bike, it kind of isn't fair. Where I learned to ride a bike, it was like cornfields. And there were no obstacles and no hills. It was easy. But in this city, you got a whole lot of obstacles and a whole lot of hills. It's very different. And honestly, it's much harder here to learn how to ride a bike. But it doesn't matter that it's harder. You still have to learn. And if you're ever going to be successful, you have to learn to succeed in your real environment. You have to learn how to ride here, not there. It's an interesting lesson. You're like, but it's so hard. Yep, it's hard for everybody. Not a single person it's not hard for. There's not a single person that doesn't have baggage. There's not a single person amongst us that's perfect. Now, in the same vein of silence, thinking about this, there's this thing, maybe you've heard of it, or maybe you've heard them, called the Miranda rights. The Miranda rights are these things that happen when you get arrested. You know, 
This is a trigger alert, so trigger warning here, everybody. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you can, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak to an attorney, to have an attorney present during any questioning. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you at government expense. This is interesting. You have the right to remain silent. Spiritually, if the devil tries to arrest you, you have the right to remain silent. You also have a right later on to praise the devil down, but that's a different thing. You have the right to remain silent when it comes to falling into Satan's traps. You have the right to remain silent. Like, don't complain. You have the right to remain silent. You don't have to complain. You don't have to give the devil that foothold in your life. You have the right to remain silent. You don't have to speak in a hopeless manner. You have the right to remain silent. So the devil can't use that against you. You can remain silent so the devil can't take your words and beat you with them. You have the right to remain silent. As the worship team comes back up. When the devil starts planting things in your mind, now pay attention to this. When the devil starts putting things in your mind, guess what? You don't actually have to say those things out loud. Or on Facebook. Like if you if you're past a sentence on Facebook, just delete. <laughs> delete. If you're frustrated when you start writing, just delete it. Just because it's in your brain doesn't mean it has to come out. There's a major, major milestone in maturity. It is learning to not say all the things you think. Guess what? Not all the things you think are okay. Many of the things, if not most of the things, if not all the things we think are wrong. We've got to test everything against the Word of God. If I just stood up here and said only the things I think, it would be very problematic. It's why I spend a lot of time scripting out my messages and then editing them and deleting things. Like, oh, thank you for showing me that, Jesus. That was incorrect. <laughs> Job 19, Job once again says, But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. No matter what I'm going through, faith is the foundation that hope stands on. But if your foundation of faith is cracked, your hope will fail. Hope will follow faith, and then assurance will come. Maybe, maybe you're a single mom and you're thinking to yourself over and over again, the devil's just speaking things into your life that no one will ever love you. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm running out of time. Will I always be alone? Or maybe you're a student and you're saying, Am I, I'm never going to be any good at school. I'm never going to amount to anything. Or sometimes when people start to age a little bit, they'll think things like, say things like, I'm getting so old. And then we start to do dumb things like we're old. You give yourself permission to believe things so that Satan can play havoc with you. Because you've now said things that now you're starting to believe that aren't true. So you have the right to remain silent. Listen, here's, a few, here's something that I know. I know that in my journey of life, I will suffer, but I know that my Redeemer lives. I recognize that I live in a fallen and broken and chaotic world and that Satan is stealing and destroying and killing things and people. Yet I am committed to taking back what the enemy has stolen from me and I am committed to helping you take back what the enemy has stolen from you. And by faith, I have hope and assurance that in the end, my Redeemer Jesus will stand victorious and I will stand with him and I have faith and hope and assurance that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, we will all together stand with Jesus as well. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as we close today?
Amen. Go ahead and stand. Friends, today, in order to take back, as we're on this journey, in order to continue to take back what the enemy has stolen, you need to exercise the faith that you already have so that it can be strengthened. But maybe faith is new to you today. Maybe this isn't part of your story. Maybe it hasn't been part of your journey to this point. Well, maybe today is an opportunity for you to take your first step on a journey of faith calling out to Jesus, inviting Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to lead your life, surrendering control of yourself to God. None of that's easy, by the way, but it's a starting point. And in your own words, in your own way, you tell that to God. As the worship team leads us in a song, the altars are open. Let's respond to God where he's speaking to us today and how you can take your next step on this faith journey. Altars are open.